Looking back just 30 years ago, it was almost unimaginable the heights modern CGI would eventually reach. We've gone from clearly artificial and plasticky looking abominations to beautiful, nearly photorealistic artworks. Now, if you're thinking, well, I can still tell that CGI, you're wrong because this is a photo. This is CGI. How did we get here? What algorithms enable such photorealistic results? Today, we'll look at ray tracing, the dominant technique used for movies, artworks, and infrequently but increasingly in video games. We'll also look at Restir, a recent innovation that substantially increases speed without sacrificing much quality. At its core, ray tracing is able to replicate reality because it almost exactly replicates how light works. Light is generated by light sources, bounces around a scene, and eventually hits the retina or sensor of an observer. As it bounces around, the light becomes tinted by the colors of surfaces it encounters. This is because the surface always absorbs a certain amount of the incoming light. What's left over gets reflected. Ray tracing replicates this. It creates many mathematical objects called rays, emitting them from light sources and seeing where they intersect objects in the scene. When they do, other rays are randomly fired from the points of intersection, hitting other points where other rays are emitted, repeating until the rays hit the simulated camera. The original color of the light and the color of the surfaces the rays hit determines what color of light has arrived at the camera. The exact spot the camera is hit determines where on the image that color goes. If multiple rays hit the same spot, their colors are averaged together. The more rays we fire, the brighter and less grainy the image gets. If you've taken pictures with an old film camera, you may be familiar with this effect, where long exposure times are required to get an image that isn't noticeably grainy. Let's dig a bit deeper into the details of how this all works. Every ray of light starts its life imbued with a particular color given by the light source it's emitted from. In computer graphics, we often represent colors using amounts of red, green, and blue light. We do this because it's enough to replicate most of the colors visible to the average person. Here's some examples of how to make different colors by combining different amounts of red, green, and blue light. What this means mathematically is that every color in computer graphics is represented by three numbers. Let's say our light source gives every ray it emits a color notated as 10, 10, 10, a very bright white. The next step is to shoot that ray to see which surface it first interacts with. Looks like it hit this blue surface. We multiply the color of the light with the color of the surface because the latter represents what percentage of light gets reflected instead of absorbed. The result is the color of the light once it bounces off the surface. Notice that all the colors of these objects have components less than one. This is because no real life object reflects more light than is shown on it, respecting the all important conservation of energy. Another real life detail that we have to take into account is that light is tinted differently depending on the angle it comes in at and the angle it leaves at. For example, if you look at a phone screen straight on, it's mostly black with just a hint of reflection. But when you tilt it flat, it reflects the surrounding environment almost perfectly, like a well-polished mirror. This discrepancy is encoded in something called the bi-directional reflectance distribution function. Now, this doesn't quite sound like English, so I'll break it down real quick. Reflectance means that this function tells us how light is tinted when it's reflected by a surface. Bidirectional tells us that the tinting can change, based on an incoming direction, where the light is coming from, and an outgoing direction, where the light is headed. Distribution is kind of redundant in this phrase. What this all means is that we can plug in an incoming direction and an outgoing direction into the BRDF to get the tinting of light passing through that path. A BRDF for a phone screen would show darker tinting at steep angles and brighter tinting at shallow angles. We can graph a BRDF like this. This visualization shows us how bright the tinting is for all possible outgoing directions given a particular incoming direction. So, for example, a lot of light is getting reflected in this direction, but not much is getting reflected in this direction. Notice that some amount of the incoming light gets scattered in all directions. This is called the diffuse component of the BRDF. 
sunlight is instead directed sharply towards a particular output direction. This is called the specular component. Different materials can have radically different BRDFs. For example, here's what cardboard looks like. And here's what a mirror looks like. This BRDF numerically reaches 70, suggesting that light reflected in that direction is 70 times more intense than the light coming in. This may seem like it's violating the conservation of energy. When I first saw this, I spent the better part of a day making sure I got the BRDF equations correct. It turns out that this does still conserve energy. It's all dependent on how we use the BRDF. We start at each light source, creating a bunch of rays initialized with the red, green, and blue values of that light source. We then find out where these rays first intersect a surface. We pick an outgoing direction and use the BRDF of the surface we hit to see how we should tint the light. We then tint it accordingly and determine which surface we hit if we go in the outgoing direction, repeating the process when we get there. Eventually, we'll reach the camera, in which case the final color carried by the ray is averaged into the image. This last step is ultimately why our mirror BRDF conserves energy. Rays coming in from a handful of directions will produce concerningly high results, but these will ultimately be balanced out by other rays. Some of the rays will hit the same spot in the image, but pass through a path where the BRDF is zero. When this is averaged with the rays that bring lots of light into the camera, we get a result that conserves energy. Ultimately, the fact that the BRDF peaks at a concerningly high value doesn't matter, because the BRDF averages to a value less than one. Like most first attempts at computer algorithms, this exact technique is very slow. Let's look at why this is the case and how we can fix it. First, notice that many rays will have to bounce many times before hitting the camera. The core issue here is that the camera sensor is tiny and only accepts rays from a limited range of angles. This makes it very unlikely for any individual ray to hit the camera. We can solve this problem by doing the whole process in reverse. Instead of shooting rays out of light sources and into the camera, we shoot rays out of the camera and into light sources. We then perform our tinting calculations in reverse, starting with the light source hit at the end and progressively multiplying by the BRDF result of earlier and earlier hit surfaces. This technique works well because typically more of the scene is occupied with lights than with cameras. However, doing things in reverse introduces some inaccuracies we'll need to fix. For example, let's say we're rendering an image of a plane. With our old technique, light would be emitted by this light source and would bounce into the camera. Notice how if we rotate this plane, the light reflected into the camera gets more spread out, resulting in a darker image. Now let's switch to shooting rays out of the camera. Notice how no matter what angle we rotate the plane at, the rays can always hit the light source. There's nothing to indicate that a plane at a shallow angle should be darker than a plane at a sharp angle, since the light source emits the same brightness at all points. In general, this means that any part of a surface that isn't pointing directly towards the light source would show up brighter than it should be in real life. We need to correct for this to get a realistic result. What we want is a way to darken light that hits surfaces at low angles while preserving light that hits surfaces straight on. A useful construct here is the normal vector a ray pointing one unit in the direction the surface is facing. The normal vectors of a sphere look like this. And on a cube, they look like this. Now what we want to find is how close this normal vector is to the direction we choose to simulate light coming from. We can determine this using a dot product, which when used on two vectors of length one, gives us a value of one when they are pointed in the same direction, and a progressively lower value as they drift apart eventually reaching zero when they are perpendicular. Tinting our light by this amount produces correct results. Now's a good time to look at what's called the rendering equation. Don't run away, I know it looks scary, but it's actually just fancy notation for all the things we've talked about so far. This equation tells us how much light is emitted by a particular surface in a particular direction. The direction the light leaves in is called omega O, O for outgoing. This squiggle and this d omega i is an integral. All it's saying is to take the average of this inner expression over all possible incoming light directions. It says that the amount of light emitted by a surface 
is affected by the light that comes in from any direction, called omega i. The expression inside the integral says what color of light is coming from each direction. It does this by multiplying a few terms. Remember that multiplication tints the color of light. This L term is the light purely coming in from a particular direction. This F term is the BRDF, telling us how much the light specified by L is reflected in the direction we're currently talking about. And finally, this dot product tints the light according to the angle between the incoming light and the surface normal, so that hitting it at a shallower angle results in less light being emitted. Once you know what it means, this equation serves as a handy reminder of all the things that go into rendering. One point of difference between this equation and what we're actually doing is that the equation says to average over all possible directions, but we're just picking a single direction and running with it. This ultimately works the same as averaging over all possible directions, because if we shoot enough rays going in enough random directions, we'll get close enough to the actual result that no one will be able to tell the difference. This kind of technique is actually a way to solve complex integrals in general. It's referred to as a Monte Carlo method, because it relies on random sampling to get close enough to a complex result. A more involved way to speed up our algorithm is by sampling more often directions that contribute more light to the final image. In this scene, we can sample more often the directions that lead immediately to this large light source, and sample other dimmer directions less often. Simply dividing the result to account for the fact that these few directions are technically unlikely and make up only a small portion of possible directions is all that's needed to produce a correct result from this kind of technique. This approach is called important sampling because we're favoring more important paths through the scene over less important ones. This is one of the stepping stones to understanding Reister, so it's worth getting into some more of the details. In Reister, we're solving a slightly different problem than the one we've been looking at. Reister solves the problem of direct lighting, how light bounces at most once off an object and into the camera. We're not dealing with indirect lighting here, where light bounces more than once though we'll later generalize the algorithm to work with such cases. In Reister, instead of using our old integral, we use this newer, shinier one. The major difference is that instead of averaging over all possible directions, we're now averaging over all possible points on all possible light sources. This, however, introduces a couple problems, just like going backwards did earlier. For one, we need this new V term that excludes light sources that aren't visible. The value x being plugged in is the ray from the current point to the considered light source. The value of v is 0 whenever said ray is blocked by an object. Another difference is that we have introduced something called the inverse square law. With our old system, if an object were farther away from a light source, fewer rays would hit it, resulting in it looking darker. With our new system, we're averaging over every light emitting point all the time, so we always have the same number of rays going from the surface to the light source, meaning it would always appear to be the same brightness. This inverse square term corrects for that. I'll be skipping over the explanation for brevity, but you can pause if you want the details. Anyway, to render an image, we want to find the average value of this inner expression. We're going to be exploring ways of more efficiently shooting our rays so that we get faster results. However, when talking about rays, it can be hard to tell what's going on. For example, the image on the left is actually a more optimal way to shoot rays than the image on the right, but you can't really tell because there's so much going on. Let's instead make a simpler function as an analogy for the part of the rendering equation we're trying to find the average of. Since there are many directions where little light comes in, our analogous function should have a low value in most places. Since there are only a few directions where a lot of light comes from, our analogous function should have a high value in only a few places. We'll now explore better ways to find the average of this analogous function, occasionally looking back to see how what we found applies to rendering. When we were looking at rendering earlier, we picked random points and sampled the function at those points, taking the average of the results. We could do the same thing here, and our result would eventually converge on the correct answer of 1. But notice how most of the samples end up sampling places where the function is close to 0. This is like shooting most of our rays in directions where light doesn't exist. What we really care about are the lit parts of the scene, or the high parts of the function. 
We've already assumed that most of the function will be close to zero. We don't need hundreds of samples to confirm this fact. It would be good to take only a few samples of the low parts. We just have to take into consideration that these few samples will count for a large part of the function. We'll generate more samples at the high parts and fewer samples at the low parts. Formally, what we're doing is sampling according to a probability density function, or PDF for short. This graph we're trying to find the average of doubles as a graph of which points we should sample more often if we want a faster result. It is both the sampled function and the PDF we're using to sample it. However, if we just take the average of these new samples, we'd end up with an unnaturally high result, since all the samples are clustered near the high parts now. We instead want to use something called a weighted average. We give samples at the low parts of functions high weights, and samples at high parts of the function low weights. This means that low samples will count for more, making up for the fact that there are less of them. Taking an average while considering these weights produces a correct result. We'll eventually arrive at the correct answer of 1, while needing fewer samples to actually get to that point. There is, however, one problem with this technique. We're assuming that it's possible to easily draw samples proportional to our PDF. We're assuming that it's possible to make samples that are more tightly concentrated towards the higher regions. However, this usually requires that we can write the function as a simple mathematical expression. The light coming in from any particular direction is dependent on the rendering equation, which as we've seen before is far from simple. So that means it's not exactly possible to draw samples such that brightly lit regions are sampled more often than dimly lit ones. So important sampling is unfortunately a bit of a dead end right now. What would make important sampling substantially better is if there was some kind of magical machine that could take our sh uniform samples and distribute them according to some complicated PDF. Too bad that hasn't been invented yet. So it turns out, in 2005, a technique called resampled important sampling was invented that does exactly what we want. It's a technique for turning bad samples into good samples and estimating the average of a function with those good samples. You start by generating a bunch of bad samples, say evenly distributed ones. These samples need to be distributed according to a simple PDF. Then you compute how much weight they have in the more complicated PDF over how much weight they have in the simpler PDF. Since our simple PDF has everything equally likely, the denominator is always 1, so all the weights are exactly as they are in the more complicated PDF. The way we would apply this to rendering would be to make the simple PDF pick random directions to shoot rays in, while the complex PDF computes how much light is coming from that direction. This results in brighter directions having a higher weight than darker ones. If one sample has a weight of 1, but another has a weight of 4, it's saying that the latter should appear 4 times as much if the samples really were drawn from our more complicated PDF. The next step is to take all these samples and pick one according to their weights, higher weighted samples being more likely to be selected. This sample can then be treated as if it was drawn from the more complex PDF. We can plug it into the function we want to find the average of, and give it a weight of 1 over the complex PDF at that point, just like we did with important sampling. Remember that this weight compensates for certain regions being sampled more often than others. The result is an estimate of the average value of the function. In the case of our rendering algorithm, we can use it to efficiently find the average of the rendering equation because this whole procedure we just did prefers samples pointing towards light over samples pointing towards darkness. Unfortunately, this procedure has an issue. If we take only a small number of samples in the first step, the sample we pick won't actually conform to the more complex distribution like we wanted. For example, if we start with two samples from a flat PDF and pick from them with weights according to this more complicated PDF, the sample we get won't actually conform to the more complicated PDF. Instead, it conforms to a PDF sort of halfway in between. In other words, the sample we pick is still somewhat distributed according to a flat distribution. The way we fix this problem is by taking the average weight of all the bad samples and use it to weight our estimate of the average of the function. This means that if we happen to draw a bunch of bad samples, the result will be given a lower weight. It's not exactly intuitive, but this procedure perfectly cancels out the effect of only picking a few samples. If you're curious, I've linked the paper that introduces this technique in the description.
it gives a full proof for why this last step actually works. Like before with the rendering equation, let's write down all the steps involved in RIS using mathematical symbols. First, x1 through xm are values from the simple bad PDF. We then compute a weight for each sample, which is how likely it is in the more complex PDF over how likely it is in the simpler PDF. If the simple PDF is one everywhere, like when drawing uniformly distributed samples, then this just reduces to the complex PDF. We then draw a sample y proportional to these weights, which is roughly like drawing a sample from the more complex PDF. This is our good sample. We plug the sample into the function f we're trying to find the average of, and give it a weight of 1 over the complex PDF at that point. Remember that this weight compensates for certain regions being sampled more often than others. If we were doing regular importance sampling, this would be our estimate. But since we're doing RIS, we need to do one final step. We need to multiply the weight by the average weight of all the bad samples. Remember that this term mysteriously corrects for the inaccuracies introduced by only picking a few samples at the start. Now that we know how it works, we can use RIS in our rendering algorithm. In Restir, we start by generating a bunch of bad samples by picking random points on random light sources. An equal weight to all light emitting points in the scene is our original PDF. We then weigh these samples according to something called the unshadowed light contribution basically saying how much light will bounce off the given surface from the given light point, assuming there's nothing blocking it. It takes into account how bright the light source is, how far away it is, what angle it hits at, and the BRDF of the surface. Higher weights are assigned to sample points that are bright, close, and hit the surface straight on. Lower weights are given to sample points that are dark, far away, and hit the surface at shallow angles. This is our complex PDF. We don't include the visibility term at this stage, because computing it by far takes the most time out of all the parts of the rendering equation. This way we can filter out a bunch of bad candidates before ever needing to do this more intensive computation. So now that we have our samples and our weights, we pick one of the samples according to the weights. Looks like this one got selected this time. It's not the brightest candidate we could have selected, but hey, that's randomness for you. We then do the full computation of the rendering equation including the visibility term. We then weight this value to correct for the fact that some regions are being sampled more densely than others and to correct for the error introduced by RIS. And we're done. We can repeat this process as many times as we'd like and average the results to get a progressively clearer picture. Here's some results from the original restart paper. In their notation, the value m means how many bad samples were generated to pick from and the value n is how many times they picked a sample to then plug into the rendering function. Notice how many of the pixels are dark in earlier images. By generating only a very small number of bad samples, only a handful of pixels luck out and get good ones. But by generating loads of bad samples and picking on average only the best ones, we get a much better result. Now, we've skipped over how exactly we're supposed to draw samples such that higher weighted samples are more likely. One way is to arrange all the samples on a number line, with higher weights taking up larger space. We then pick a random number and see which part of the number line it corresponds to. While it works, it's not ideal. Computationally, we have to check about half of the segments on average to determine which one the number is in. We also have to make room to store each of the samples. It would be nice if there was some kind of magic bucket we could throw all the samples into and extract a valid result out at the end. Reservoir sampling is a magic bucket you can throw samples into and get one out at the end. It works by keeping a single sample that will be our result, as well as a running total of all the weights it's seen so far. When we throw a new sample into this bucket, we flip a coin where heads is weighted the same as the incoming item, and tails is weighted with the total weight of the reservoir. If it comes up heads, the incoming item replaces the current candidate. If not, the existing item stays and the new item is discarded. No matter the result of the coin flip, the weight of the item gets added to the total. If we also keep track of the weight of the current sample and the total number of items we've seen, then it becomes easy to compute the correction weight we saw earlier. All this means that when we're performing RIS, we can throw all the candidates into this magic bucket and afterwards get out the numbers we need for the rest of the procedure. There's a useful property of reservoirs that we can take advantage of. Since multiple reservoirs pick pretty good candidates from what's been thrown into them, 
we can combine them into one super reservoir that picks a pretty good candidate from all of the things that have been thrown in. Notably, we don't actually have to throw in each of the items we threw into the other reservoirs to make this work. We just need to throw in the singular samples picked by each reservoir. One of the ways we can leverage this is to reuse candidates from past frames. For example, if this pixel had picked from 10 candidates on the previous frame, and it picks 10 candidates on the current frame, we can combine both results very quickly to effectively select from 20 candidates. And if we reuse this for the next frame, which picks another 10 candidates, we'll effectively be picking from 30. This procedure is called temporal reuse because we're reusing things across time. We do have to be careful of a couple of things though. For one, both objects in the scene and the camera viewing the scene may move between frames. If you've seen my previous video or just have experience with computer graphics in general, you'll know that we store the position, rotation, and scale of objects using matrices. By using the matrices both for the current frame and the previous frame, we're able to calculate for every pixel in the current frame the position it must have appeared at on the previous frame, allowing us to reuse the correct pixels. The other thing is that the lighting conditions may change, either due to moving objects or to changing materials. This means we need to re-weight each sample to account for any changes that occur. Doing so is pretty straightforward. We first recompute the unshadowed light contribution to see how much weight we should give the sample under the new conditions. Then, the final weight we give each sample is the correction weight computed in RIS times the new recomputed weight. What we're doing is effectively resampling the samples a second time. The samples start off in one PDF, the light contribution during the previous frame, and end up in another one, the light contribution during the current frame. Unfortunately, there is a drawback to resampling like this. The RIS weights we calculated are really only designed to compensate for the specific situation they were made for, generating a bunch of samples from one PDF and picking from those. It's not built for combining multiple samples from different PDFs, like samples from different frames with different lighting conditions. This inaccuracy is not present in regular Monte Carlo sampling, which has the nice property that all you need to do to get rid of its inaccuracies is run it for longer. The way we're abusing RIS breaks this characteristic. No matter how long you run our new algorithm for, the result will always be noticeably inaccurate. There's a limit to how close it can get to an accurate result. Algorithms that are inaccurate in a way that cannot be solved by running them for longer are referred to as biased. The Restart paper offers a way to correct for this, but it perceptually looks worse than the bias technique due to being noticeably slower. And this video is getting long enough as is, so I'll skip over it for brevity. Since we've come up with a technique for reusing samples that came from different situations, let's try applying it a bit more aggressively. We can add a step to our algorithm after temporal reuse to combine results from neighboring pixels. We can have each pixel look at its own result and the results of its eight neighbors and combine them all into a new super reservoir. This technique is called spatial reuse because we're reusing data across different parts of the image. This kind of reuse is helpful because neighboring pixels are often close to each other in the scene, meaning that they will want similar kinds of candidates. What's likely a good candidate for one pixel is likely a good candidate for its neighbors. We can then repeat spatial reuse, but since each pixel has already incorporated the best candidates from its neighbors, we can instead tell every pixel to select candidates from their neighbors three pixels over. This effectively incorporates candidates from a total of 81 pixels, while only doing calculations on nine pieces of data. Repeating this process again with neighbors 9 pixels over yields a total area of 729 pixels, and again with neighbors 27 pixels over yields 6,561 pixels. With this technique, even if only one pixel in a thousand randomly happens upon a good candidate, by the end of the process, the whole image will be filled with good candidates. You can imagine how this technique results in images being rendered hundreds of times faster than the typical Monte Carlo technique. Here's some more results from the paper. We're back to only generating 32 candidates per pixel. Notice how sparse everything looks on the left because of it. But as we progressively apply more and more spatial reuse, we get a progressively fuller image as the rare but powerful candidates found by a few pixels propagate to their neighbors. One final thing to wrap up is how to generalize this algorithm to work with indirect lighting, where light hits multiple surfaces before entering the camera. The procedure is not too different. 
First, instead of generating candidates on random light sources, we generate candidates by shooting rays in random directions and seeing where they hit. We then simulate multiple bounces for each of these points to get an estimate of how much light reaches that point. These are our samples, and our complex PDF is how much of this light reaches and bounces off of the original surface. We can then select from and reuse these samples, just like we did before. And that's pretty much it. If you want more details, I've linked both the original Restart paper and the paper that applies it to indirect lighting in the description. And with that, we're done. We've covered how ray tracing generates realistic images by simulating how light works in the real world. We've looked at how this can be improved by sampling bright sources more regularly. We've looked at resampled importance sampling, a practical technique for accomplishing such a thing. We checked out reservoir sampling, a neat way to implement RIS that also lets us easily combine samples from different domains. We used this to invent two techniques, spatial and temporal reuse, to reuse samples across space and time respectively. Finally, we covered how to generalize these techniques to work with global illumination and not just direct lighting. Now that you have an understanding of these techniques, I would encourage anyone who has some coding experience to take a shot at implementing these algorithms. It's very rewarding to see how effective these algorithms are at improving the quality of rendering. All this is the power behind modern CGI, which, when used well, can pass for photography. I hope you learned something interesting, and thanks for watching.